The story behind the crisis of unaccompanied children crossing our southwestern border is often a chilling one. Many of those youngsters are fleeing terrible violence in their home countries of Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Mexico. Children and teenagers are being robbed, raped, coerced into drug gangs, forced into prostitution, and in far too many cases, murdered. Back in July, the New York Times told its readers what happened to two boys from Honduras, Anthony Castellanos and his brother Kenneth. The Times wrote, they were found within days of each other, both dead. Anthony, 13, and a friend had been shot in the head. Kenneth, 7, had been tortured and beaten with sticks and rocks. They were among seven children murdered in the La Pradera neighborhood of San Pedro Sula in April alone, part of a surge in gang violence that is claiming younger and younger victims. What is our obligation to those youngsters who have fled to the United States in search of safety and a better life? We'll talk about that with my guest, Laird Bergad, a distinguished professor at Lehman College and director of the Center for Latin American Studies at the CUNY Graduate Center, and Thanu Yakupiriyage, communications coordinator for the New York Immigration Coalition. Welcome. Thanks so much for uh, coming in. So um, tens of thousands of these children have come to the United States, I guess, over the last year, year and a half or so. Now, this is not a new problem in the sense that for years unaccompanied children have come to the U.S. But there has been a surge recently. What's driving that surge? We spoke of the violence, but, but what are some of the other factors driving that surge? Professor? Well, I think first of all, uh, you just mentioned violence. Uh, Honduras is the murder capital of the world. Um, the highest murder rate of any country in not only Latin America but the world. And that's increased over the last decade. Let me give you some data here. Mm -hmm. uh, in Honduras in, in 2000, the murder rate was about 50 per 100,000 residents. Today, it, or in 2012, it stood at 90. Uh, by way of comparison, in Chicago, one of the most violent cities and highest murder rates in the United States, the murder rate is 15 per 100,000 people. And in the United States at large, it's five. So one of the things that has occurred is a a, an extraordinary uh, surge in violence, and much of it is gang-related and drug-related. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, children especially uh, are victims. Uh, they're press-ganged into working for drug gangs uh, in environments which are typified by extraordinary poverty, high rates of unemployment. Um, and uh, I think that that's really uh, the crux of the problem, and it's why you see uh, this, this extraordinary surge uh, in migration. The violence seems to have had a particular impact on children. Um, can you explain why that should be the case? Um, well, it's exactly as you said. I think that there's been a particular surge in the, the amount of gang violence that's happening in Honduras, Guatemala, parts of Mexico, and that's really impacting a lot of young children. I've been actually reading through case dockets recently from Central American Legal Assistance and other or legal assistance organizations in New York that are showing um, cases of basically children as young as 14 who are bringing over the border their eight-year-old sisters, their infant brothers and sisters, um, and it really is because the way in which gang violence is functioning is that they're trying to recruit younger and younger people, younger and younger children, and as children say no, that they don't want to be a part of gangs, what happens is these gangs therefore um, harass the children, harass the families, um, oftentimes will come to the families asking for money, um, trying to um, get land from the family, and this is resulting in um, um, the death of family members. Um, I was just reading through a case where a young boy, his school teacher actually was the one who called his mother who was working in the United States and asked her to take her child because the situation in their town in Honduras was so bad. Um, so this is really the situation that's facing thousands of young children. Right. Uh, now, Professor, uh, so there are essentially two streams. There are the youngsters who are uh, fleeing the violence. That's especially in Honduras, but not just in Honduras, if I understand it correctly. But then there are the uh, children who are growing up in very extreme poverty, um, not much in the way of opportunity, uh, not many uh, chances to get a decent education. So they're coming here for a better life as well. Mm -hmm. Do we have a sense of the relative sizes of these two different streams? I don't think we have an empirical sense, and I think that anthropologists and sociologists have their work cut out for them. I think that 
uh, some of the um, uh, motivational factors uh, are unknown. First of all, we don't know how many children are coming here for family reunification, whose parents or one parent or some other uh, 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 adult relations are already in the United States. Uh, we don't know the role that parents in uh, Honduras, Guatemala, Salvador, the three big countries, and Mexico, of course, uh, the role that parents play in, in uh, contracting coyotes or the, the people who, tra who transport them uh, to get them across the border for a better life. Um, I think I have my doubts about whether this is some sort of spontaneous movement simply originating with young people. I think that adults are involved. And I think that the smugglers, the people who smuggle children, are preying upon vulnerable people. One other factor I'd like to add, the role of rumor uh, DACA in the United States, the deferred uh, action that doesn't deport children here. Mm -hmm. uh, how, what this kind is of a recent initiative of the United States. Right, which is states back from 2012, mm -hmm. uh, which basically grants amnesty to children under the, who arrived in the United States under the age of 16. We don't know how information about DACA is circulated in, the, in San Pedro Sula or Tegucigalpa or San Salvador, places where these migrants are originating. It may be that people have, uh, that adults are erroneously informed about the fact that if people arrive in the United States, they will be granted some sort of amnesty and permanent residence. So they may think that right. if someone 8, 10, 12 years old shows right. up across the border, right. we'll just welcome them. Mm -hmm. That may be the impression, but again, this is, I'm speculating here. Right. It's mm -hmm. imprecise. We simply don't know about the motivations, mm -hmm. uh, where this kind of information uh, is, how it's disseminated, mm -hmm. how it's internalized. Right. Uh, and, and I'd like to push back on that a little bit. Um, I mean, I think it's, it is very... It, it is really unknown what some of the motivational factors are. Certainly, I'm sure there's coyotes and ad other adults who are just like notarios in the U.S. who manipulate um, immigrants in order to get money for them and, and say, oh, well, we can get you green cards if you give us this much money. I'm sure that's happening, you know, in parts of Central America. But one thing... Which is not true, obviously. Yes, yeah. which is not true. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that we say is, you know, I think that the violence factor is a large part of this. And... The idea that, um, you know, a nine-year-old is thinking in his head, well, you know, I can get DACA once I get to the to the U.S. It seems a little bit implausible to me. And I also want to say that um, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals has been very, very critical for young people, for dreamers who came to the U.S. at young ages, who have lived in the United States as Americans, have gone to elementary school, have gone to high school here, and are trying to go to college. Just last week... Um, Congress and the Re Republicans in Congress did a symbolic vote in which they killed DACA, in which they voted to get rid of deferred action for childhood arrivals. If that would happen, millions of young people who have now over the last two years benefited from deferred action, who are working in the United States, are now contributing economically and being able to put themselves through school would be at risk if DACA was taken away. Um, I also know that the, the government is now implementing programs in Honduras and Guatemala where they're actually giving out the appropriate information about what DACA is and how these young children cannot actually apply for deferred action. So as I uh, look at this, I, I try to think of um, uh, what might, in fact, be driving an individual or two or three individual youngsters. So let's say someone is nine years old or 11 years old. Um, it's hard to imagine that they just sort of spontaneously decided that they wanted to go to the United States, or even if they did, mm -hmm. that they could figure out how to do it. Um, so do you have any sense from folks that you've uh, talked to or any um, sense at all about how the idea of actually physically taking off and going to the United States mm -hmm. occurs in, in, these, in these youngsters. I, I presume there must be some adult involvement. Yes, of course. I mean, I think sometimes it's actually family members who are saying, sending their um their, their children away. Some of the children have family members in the U.S., and so those, um, those adults, mothers and fathers, are, are basically asking for their children to be brought here. It's happening through coyotes. There's also cases I've heard of, um, you know, coyotes and other unscrupulous adult individuals who are basically advertising that they can take children across the border. Mm -hmm. um, but in a lot of cases, it is actually adults. It is you know, grandparents who can no longer take care of their children, 
who see that their kids can't go to school in their small towns who, are, who think that it would actually be safer to send their children to the United States. So I'd like to get both of your views on this, not as uh, you're not public officials, not as public officials, but just you know, as human beings looking at a um, uh, extremely difficult situation. If you have um, some youngsters here who are coming to the U.S. For, uh, because the economic conditions uh, they feel would be better for them, they'd have more opportunity. Um, and then on the other hand, you have a group of youngsters who are fleeing terrible violence and who in fact um, uh, might be threatened with death if they, if they were sent back to their home communities. Um, first, um, Ms. Yakupidiyage, how should we view these two streams? What do you think our obligation would be to the youngsters seeking economic opportunity on the other hand? and youngsters fleeing on, on the one hand and youngsters fleeing violence on the other hand? You know, I think the United States as a country has always had a history of welcoming immigrants. You know, this is an immigrant nation. This nation would not exist without immigrants, whether it be from Europe, from other parts of the world. Um, even uh, people coming through Ellis Island, you know, a hundred years ago, some of them actually were unaccompanied minors, if you want to put it, like people as young as 14, 13, coming without parents and coming to the U.S. for economic opportunity. And so my question really is, why should that change? I think that the United States has an obligation to welcome immigrants. I think the U.S. has an obligation to deal with a humanitarian crisis, particularly one that they may have had a hand in creating. A lot of the issues around violence and um, lack of ac economic opportunity in countries like Honduras, Mexico, um, Guatemala are really because of U.S. economic policies in Central America. And so I think all of those considerations need to be taken into account when considering why we should be welcoming these children. But it sounds like you would not make much of a distinction, though, between the two groups. I, as an advocate, I would, you know, I would myself um, be supportive of both streams of children. There's people who come from all over the world for economic opportunities, and I think that that's just as valuable as those children who come fleeing violence. Uh, Dr. Bergad, do you have a, a view uh, on this? Let me this? back up a second. Mm -hmm. Coming to the United States for opportunity from Central America or Mexico, it's not exactly a new and novel idea. Mm -hmm. this, has exactly. been, this has been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, fleeing poverty, fleeing violence uh, is something that has uh, really, uh, are situations that have been endemic in the region for a long time and well before the United States ever got involved in the region. We can go back to the 16th, 17th, 18th century during the Spanish period, but coming to the United States is not original. What is original is this a wave of children that are coming. Mm -hmm. Now let me, let me point out s certain things. Some, some, again, data tells a story. Poverty rates, socioeconomic origins. The poverty rate in Honduras is 65% of the population mm -hmm. lives in poverty. And generally when you see a poverty rate that high, childhood poverty is much, much higher. And it, we, can go down, we can go down the list here. In Guatemala, it's 54%. Uh, in Mexico, it's 52%. In El Salvador, it's slightly less than 35%. Now, that's one thing. Second thing, the demographic structures of these societies is very different than what we find, for example, in the United States or Western Europe, in that we have a very high percentage of young people. Let me give you some statistics, some data here. About 37% of the population of Honduras is under the age of 15. Okay, that compares to 20% in the United States. That compares to 17% in Great Britain. And we can go down the list. Uh, Guatemala also around 37%. So we have societies that are, have what we could refer to as traditional age pyramids that are heavily, uh, uh, young uh, heavily comprised of young people who don't have opportunities. Mm -hmm. Uh, to move forward in job markets uh, within the context of the economic systems that are highly restrictive and favor elite groups. And uh, let me address the, an issue of, of responsibility. And I think uh, I certainly agree that the United States has always been a nation of immigrants. Uh, I'm the grandchild of immigrants uh, and should be more welcoming. That's very difficult in a political environment uh, where uh, certain sectors of the American uh, political body are anti-immigrant and anti, uh, simply oppose any kind of welcoming. This is also something that is not new in the context of the history of the United States. 
We can go back to the 19th century. We can look at political parties whose platforms uh, were built on anti-immigrant policies, opposing the Irish, opposing the uh, Scotch-Irish, opposing German immigration. And anti-immigrant politics is not something that is the product of the contemporary era. This is part of the history of the United States. You've given us a pretty vivid picture of the challenges that these young folks would face back in their home countries. The question becomes, how does America react once they show up on our shores? Um, would you make a distinction between the ones fleeing violence and the ones uh, solely seeking economic uh, opportunity? And, um, and what kind of moral as well as a political obligation do you think we would uh, have in this country when we know that the situations in other countries are so dire? Well, I, let me say that I think that whether it's uh, violent related or the absence of economic opportunities, I think these things are intertwined. Mm -hmm. There does seem to be a very clear uh, correlation between the upsurge in murder rates, which I cited earlier, uh, and the increase in, in uh, children arriving in the United States. So I, I think that they're intertwined. It's very hard to, to make a distinction between the two. So neither one of you are making much of a dis distinction well, I think between, that it's the, a, between the two. I think it's a false dichotomy to say, are they coming because of violence or are they coming because of economic mm -hmm. opportunity? Because those things are, as he, he's saying, very intertwined. Um, the lack of economic, uh, economic opportunities often, often ends up being that, a situation where then people turn to gangs. So those who lack op economic opportunity go towards gang violence. They try and recruit other, other members into their gangs. These are the people who are fleeing, who both are being challenged by not being able to work in their countries, not having a lack of economic opportunity, and also facing violence in their communities. So we need to really see that as a bundle. So it's very hard to distinguish at the border, what do you say to a child? Did you come for economic opportunity or did you come because of violence? That seems to me um, something that is very implausible to do as a child comes into the US. What do we know about um, what happens to these youngsters once they get, once they get here? Um, um, some, I imagine, are, are united with relatives who are in this country, but uh, do we have a sense of what happens yes. uh, with the youngsters? Um, so since October of last year, uh, the reports are over 52,000 um, young children, unaccompanied minors, have crossed um, through the U.S. Um, th that statistic of 52,000 people, young, young children, have been detained um, at the border. Um, and so now what's happening is a lot of these young people are being released. So some of these children are being released um, to family members that they have all across the United States. Um, already about 3,300 children are in New York. Um, and we anticipate another 6,000 will be coming to New York. Um, also across the, um, across the country, uh, humanitarian organizations, um, churches um, are opening up their spaces to, to be um, facilities to hold children who do not have families in the U.S. And so um, it's partially some are being held in homes, some are um, being released to their, to their family members as well. And the ones who are released to relatives, their status is not permanent, is that correct? No, so actually currently in New York and today actually, um, uh, there's a series of um, immigration court cases that are now being um, seen at 26 Federal Plaza. Um, President Obama uh, has pushed so that the cases of unaccompanied children and their families um, are being um, bumped up and the, pr this, the process of these deportation hearings are being sped up so that um, people who would have waited a couple of months maybe for a hearing are now being put in um, deportation hearings starting today. About 30 children today at New York immigration courts are, um, are seeing judges. And one of um, our concerns about the ways in which these quote unquote rocket dockets are happening is that it's actually not um, giving these children an opportunity to see lawyers and to really to build their cases. Um, statistics show that about 50% of cases of children who have lawyers who represent them actually do find that there are legal remedies such as asylum or refugee status that would allow them to stay in the United States. What happens when a child does not have a legal representation is that oftentimes that they will end up being deported back to situations where um, there is a lot of violence and this is really because there isn't an opportunity to really build the child's case and so the New York Immigration Coalition and all of our partners including legal service um, providers are really pushing for more resources um, to be able to represent these children. It is a violation of due process if these children do not have legal representation as they are going into immigration court for hearings. Um, Professor Bergad, you're both a historian and an expert on Latin American affairs. Um, 
looking at the history of the governments in some of these countries and then looking at the governments that exist now, what's the responsibility that the home governments have both for the conditions that are driving the youngsters here and also for the welfare of the children once they come here, many of whom uh, are going to be sent back? Well, I think this is uh, an extraordinarily important question here because I think too often the blame is laid at the uh, doorstep of the United States. And I'm not saying that the United States does, has not played from a historical point of view an extraordinary role in the region in the 19th and 20th centuries. But when we look at governments in the region, we're looking at extraordinary degrees of corruption. We're looking at uh, a high degree of militarism and repression internally. We're looking at elite social classes that do not have as their priorities uh, implementing policies which advance educational opportunities for their people, economic opportunities for social mobility. I think that a large portion of the blame for this, this kind of situation is laid at the doorstep of elites in each of the countries uh, where these children are coming from. Uh, let me shift a little bit here uh, mm -hmm. and move to some other a topic about U.S. responsibility or policy toward migrants. Um, I think that there's a great deal of hypocrisy here that we find from a historical point of view, and one can simply underline the attitude toward Cuban migrants in the aftermath mm -hmm. of the Castro Revolu Triumph right. Revolution 1959. The Cuban Adjustment Act of 1966 basically welcomed any Cuban to come here on the basis that they were refugees fleeing uh, political violence and political oppression. That was fine. It's quite fascinating to see some of the Cuban representatives in, uh, in, in Congress today opposing <laughs> the uh, admission and legalization of children right. from countries while uh, their attitude toward Cubans coming here is something entirely different. So I think that there's a, you know, U.S. policy has not been consistent. I think another thing that we have to take into consideration is Obama's policy on deportations. Mm -hmm. And we can't whitewash this and we can't just sweep this under the rug, uh, despite his popularity among Latino voters. Immigrants who aren't citizens don't vote. If we look at deportations under the, under, uh, the Clinton years, they averaged about 100,000 yearly. If we look at deportations in the Bush years, they averaged about a quarter million yearly. Under Obama, 400,000 years. Tremendous year. increase. Tremendous increase, tremendous difference. One wonders what the motivations are of these policies in the minds of our present government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are they currying favor to the right wing, which is an absolutely hopeless endeavor because the right wing opposes everything <laughs> that Obama does as right. a knee-jerk reaction? Uh, it's, I think U.S. policy really uh, has to come under some sort of uh, fine examination and to try to decipher uh, attitudes and where this is going to go. Mm -hmm. right. and, and to add to that, um, I mean this really, the case of all of these young children and really the, the, the fact of all of these deportations, it's actually the deportation mark during the, the six, seven year, six years of Obama being uh, president is now over two million. Um, and this is actually really torn families apart. A lot of families are mixed status families. You have U.S. citizen children who are being put into the foster care system because their fa parents have been deported. This is an inefficient and broken immigration system. And what we really need is for Congress to pass immigration reform, and that includes updating our asylee and refugee policies. And that will provide us with a template that is up to date that will allow us to deal with migrants who are coming um, to, to the border in fleeing violence. It will allow us to deal with the 11 million undocumented immigrants who are a vital part of the economy of the United States as well. You will get the last word. Uh, you've been uh, wonderful. Thank you for coming in. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. The death of Robin Williams has brought the painful and often tragic consequences of depression back into the public spotlight, and not a moment too soon. Major depression is a mental illness that is every bit as painful as a physical illness or injury. It can take all the joy out of living. Often, it makes life itself seem unbearable. And while it may be understandable that someone who is feeling so badly might try to self-medicate 
it's important to know that the dire effects of depression are only compounded by alcohol and drug use. For those suffering from depression, or who know someone who is suffering from depression, including perhaps a child, it is critically important to seek out professional care. There is nothing shameful about this. Depression is one of the most common disorders and it can be treated. One of the biggest problems is that depression is often so debilitating that people can come to believe that nothing will help. That is not true. Also, if you, a friend or a loved one, has been confronted by suicidal thoughts and you don't know where to turn, place a call to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That number is 1-800-273-TALK, 1-800-273-TALK, which is 1-800-273-8255. That's all for now. See you next time.